Minister of Foreign Affairs, Executive Director, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first start by thanking you, Dr. Paritarante, for giving me this opportunity to speak about sustainable peace and development in such a prestigious the institute. And as you mentioned, the topic is close to my heart. As co-chair of the UN Secretary General's Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group, very long name, and both as that and as the Prime Minister of Norway. And I would also like to say, after having spent a few days of holiday in this beautiful country, I become very fond of Sri Lanka, of its uh, wonderful people, its fascinating culture, and its magnificent scenery. Lashma Kadiragama, who gave name to this institute, lost his life in search of a path for peace. The tragedy tells us how costly and difficult achieving peace can be. Foreign Minister Karagama recognized the significant change was needed to enable Sri Lanka's communities to live together peacefully. His vision for Sri Lanka was a national identity based on pluralism. He said that, and I'd like to quote it, People who live in Sri Lanka are first and foremost Sri Lankans. Then we have our, own, our race and religion, which is something given to us at birth. This institute is keeping his vision for Sri Lanka alive by providing valuable anal analysis of the country's strategic interests in a context of a changing global realities. And I see you are using the beacon as the symbol which of course is a symbol a coastal nation like Norway really can adapt to. We have seen the beacons as, us, as the path for, as you know, Norway is the way north, and we have had beacons all the time. We know it's important to follow the light and uh, to follow the regulations so that you don't hit something on the way. So maybe this is the beacon for the future for this, uh, it, the beacon as the future for this institute is important. Since independence in 1948, Sri Lanka has consistently shouldered international responsibilities. It has taken active part in UN norm setting processes and providing staff to key UN uh, positions, including several under secretary generals. Most notably, Sri Lanka has contributed thousands of UN peacekeepers to missions around the world. At present, more than a thousand Sri Lankan troops are serving in UN peacekeeping missions in Haiti, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic. And we need those because we need, know that to get development, we also need security. These are crucial contributions, not only to peace, but also to future prospects for development in countries seriously affected by conflict. At home, Sri Lanka's uh, welfare policies have attracted international attention and influenced other nations' policymaking. Achievements in the areas of health and education were important for Sri Lanka's progress towards the Millennium Development Goals. And indeed, free education and health services have been provided for decades in this country. These and other achievements provide a good basis for achieving the new world goals, the sustainable development goals. Education, particularly for girls, is a human right as well as the most effective investment in sustainable development. Women's full and equal participation at all levels and sectors in society is vital. That includes also politics, where I see that Sri Lanka has a small challenge, and business, where Norway still has its challenges to reach our sustainable development goals. Getting the women on all levels of the economy will boost economic growth. It will help end poverty, improve global health, protect our environment and climate, and strengthen peace and stability. 
As co-chair of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's Sustainable Development Goals Advocacy Group, I am pleased that the development priorities of Sri Lanka are in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. As Prime Minister of Norway, I'm also pleased that these uh, priorities shape our bilateral development cooperation. Key goals in our cooperation include the SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 14 on conservation of the oceans, 16 on peace and justice, five on gender equality, and seven on uh, affordable and clean energy. Areas where I have discussed both with the Prime Minister and President today that we could even increase our cooperation in the time to come. First of all, I would like to share my thoughts about why and how the SDGs are a roadmap to the future we all want. Because it is the roadmap for the world, in a world where we are totally interconnected and when troubles in one spot of the world will affect the rest of the world, and we see it every day. I see the set of SDGs as the main track. It's not a side track. It's not something you do beside the rest of the work you're doing in a government. It's the main track, and it should be that for all of the world's governments. It's the main track for addressing the root causes of poverty, conflict, violent extremism, refugee crisis, youth unemployment, forced migration, and global warming. And these are the hottest topics on the world agenda today. This is what the, the UN wants to discuss this autumn. This is all these things that we need to fix to make this world a better place. These economic, social, and environmental problems are affecting us all, regardless of where we live or how we are making a living. When it comes to achieving sustainable development, all countries are developing countries. The Millennium Development Goals, that was development in the traditional term of developing countries. The Sustainable Development Goals makes all countries, including Norway, even if we are on the top of those international rankings, we also have areas that we should lift ourselves because we always can move forward and make a better job. We all, uh, when it come, uh, we all need to see the link also between the long-term work to achieve the SDGs and the comprehensive action needed to address what is broken in our world today. And our aim and the theme this summer of the, the SDGs meetings have been to leave no one behind as we make progress towards the SDGs. So why is the principle of leaving no one behind so important? I think Nelson Mandela has put it best. He said, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality exist in our world, none of us can truly rest. Eradicating extreme poverty, ensuring mothers and children do not die from avoidable uh, complications during childbirth, making sure that everyone is nourished and gets a quality education, all of this is our common responsibility. So leave no one behind is the right motto for our efforts. It's also a smart motto in our highly interdependent world. If we are to achieve lasting peace, to stop forced migration, fight pandemics, stop harmful climate change anywhere in the world, our common STD efforts must apply everywhere in the world. This is why we will not leave fragile and marginalized areas and population behind. We know from the, SDG cam uh, from the MDG campaign that reaching the most marginalized is very difficult. It's mainly due to problems of access and high, co uh, and high costs. It's often hard to reach people trapped in areas of crisis and conflict for obvious reasons of safety. And it's also costly because a good deal of infrastructure has to be built from the scratch to the poorest and the most marginalized areas of the world. This means that people living in these areas m miss out on virtually all the development taking place everywhere else in the world. 
and that they do not enjoy even the most basic rights. However, even if it's difficult, it should be taken as a challenge, not as a dis, uh, as discouragement. If it takes preventing and stopping wars, if it takes building basic infrastructure from scratch to reach those most vulnerable, marginalized and destitute, we have to do it anyway. And we are going to do it for our own common good. The SDGs are universal, as I said. We all own, this, own these goals. It's 193 leaders of their countries who have signed and voted for that in the UN. Nobody can opt out. All countries are to follow it. But it's important to understand that we can only achieve this if we work together. That means that we need a strong sense of ownership, able leadership, and innovative public partnership at all levels. And ownership means that it's not just the elite in the political life in countries that need to own the SDGs. The non-governmental sector needs to participate. Business sector needs to participate. We need to to mobilize the resources if we're going to achieve this. It's, oh, it's essential, and I also believe it's in human nature to c care about what you own. So ownership is important because it means that more people will care. Beside ownership of all the goals, not just by the leader but by everyone, it's crucial if you are going to mobilize the extra effort that is required. And there are very many good examples of building SDG ownership around the world, such as the SDG consulting process with the relevant stakeholders around the world. And we should not just do that before we decide on the SDGs, we could continue to have that dialogue and discussion also afterwards, because uh, making decision was the easiest thing. Reaching the goals is a really difficult one. Awareness and knowledge are essential for ownership. In Norway, the SDGs are to be included in our school curriculum. Ensuring free media is also an important part of our efforts because if um, political life is going to be scrutinized, we need free media to tell us when we are not achieving our goals. And the business sector, too, is taking ownership of the SDGs. It's a growing number of companies aligning their business strategies with the goals. And I have, for example, learned here that Sri Lankan textile industry has initiated energy efficiency efforts in line with the SDGs. So today, and every day until the goals are achieved, we must take concrete steps to make the world more sustainable. This requires leadership in all countries and at all levels of society. And there are already several examples from the private sector on good leadership. And now, political leaders must cultivate political will. They must translate political will into legislation, policies, concrete plans. And we learned something of those countries that did the best on the MDGs. They had concrete plans. They were checking their results and they were doing it on the ground level up to the ministerial level to really show off that they were reaching those goals. And besides doing, translating the political will into policies, we also must finance and implement the plans. Financing sustainable development requires domestic revenue generation combined with good management of existing resources and improved tax structures that eliminates tax havens. The Addis Ababa meeting last year showed, yes, there is an importance in the developing world, developed world, helping the developing world economically. But the most important part is to make sure that the resources and the economy of each country is not flown, flown away from that country. It's important to make sure that the gains that you make in a country is taxed and gets back in to the own economy. That means that generating own financial uh, means is an important part of that. 
And we need to have a global leadership on certain issues, like for example, combating corruption and combating tax havens. But it's also a question of national and local leadership, because you have to have the same local and national leadership. And if we have managed to fight corruption, if we manage to fight all of those money into tax that goes into tax havens around the world, we could in fact finance a lot of those development plans that we are working on. But this needs joint international cooperation uh, between countries and in international institutions. It's not just a question of global leadership, as I said, it's national and local leadership, but it's also a question of international solidarity. International development aid will be needed in the most vulnerable areas of the world to ensure that no one is left behind. And I think it's important to remember that those 17 goals are interconnected. And many of them, them have to be, um, you have to, uh, they are requiring cooperation across national borders. And this means that we will fail or succeed together. It will not be some countries that to succeed and some others that fail. We all have to, we will all need to cooperate to succeed together. In many areas, business as usual will not do. We have to build new and innovative partnerships. Government, business, civil society organization and academia must work together to find both efficient and sustainable solutions locally but also on the national and global level. We know that uh, international standards set by the large international corporation are important to ensure, for example, good environmental standards are put through also on the local level. And, uh, but we also know it from other areas. The best known example of international cross-sectoral partnership is probably GAVI, the Vaccine Alliance, Gavi was important for the success of the Millennium Development Goals. And we should find inspiration in that vaccine alliance as we form partnerships based on the new goals. For example, should Sri Lanka and Norway, we could work together through our fisheries to cooperate on sustainable use of maritime um, and, and marine resources, the SDG 14. We hope that the Norwegian-funded vessel, research vessel, Fritjof Nansen, will visit Sri Lankan waters next year to help in the stock assessment as a basis for that sustainable use of the natural resources. Let me just talk a few minutes also about maybe my favorite theme when it comes to the SDGs. I believe that equity in education is probably the biggest and most important key to unlocking opportunities for everybody to enjoy a good life. Worldwide, 37 million children and adolescents are out of school due to crisis and to conflict. In Syria, for example, it's clear that the international community has done too little too late because schools provide a sense of normality, a sense of hope when there's a crisis around you. It helps build skills that give young people opportunities for the future. It will be even more challenging to build inclusive and sustainable societies if children and young people are denied an education. The main responsibility of education rests with national governments. And as I mentioned, Sri Lanka has been doing a great job. Domestic resource mobilization is therefore a crucial thing. At the same time, aid will continue to play a role, especially in the poorest countries, in fragile situation and towards the marginalized groups. When my government took office three years ago, we made education the top priority in Norwegian development policy. We are in the process of doubling aid for education over a four-year period, with particular focus on girls' education and on quality and learning outcomes, vocational training, and not at least in education in emergency and protracted crisis. We have chosen a broad and comprehensive approach, and we are using a variety of channels and partners. 
We have want to spur, uh, spur action at the global, national, and local level. We are a strong supporter of uh, international multilateral organizations like UNICEF and UNESCO, and we are doubling our support to the Global Partnership for Education. A substantial part of our funding is also channeled through civil society. It's important to build accountability and engagement on a community level, and local NGOs play a key role in that work involving parents and local communities. We have, the last year, seen a downward trend in aid for education, and that must be reversed. We, we need a renewed and compelling investment case for education, and we need a financing pathway for achieving universal access to quality education. And by quality education, I mean education that really leads, gives you the skills, both the academic or the vocational skills you need to get a job, to make sure that you're not there at school. We know that there's more than 250 million people who are uh, youngsters who are going to school without learning to read and write properly, which means that we are, not in, we are investing wrongly in the way we are doing educational policies around the world. Sri Lanka has a good story. You have been um, good at this, but there's a lot of other countries that need to learn from your investment, and I'm sure, as we have discussed in some of our meetings, that maybe also here, there are challenges in the educational system that should be done better, like we have back home in Norway, where we also have to change part of our educational system. But finding this, putting this education again on the agenda is the reason why I initiated the International Commission on Financing Global Education Opportunities. Together with UNESCO's General Secretary, Irina Bokova, the presidents of Chile, Indonesia, and Malawi, we uh, established a commission last summer, which is chaired by the UN Special Envoy for Global Education, Gordon Brown. In September, this commission will submit its report to the UN Secretary General, who has promised that he will act upon this, its recommendation. And I have high hopes that this report will mobilize greater political will and more financial resources for education. Reaching SDG 4 and other goals is going to be a challenge. What the um, leaders of uh, governments and, uh, and states decided in 2015 was an ambitious plan for the next 15 years. The uh, new development agenda offers also a unique opportunity. For the first time in history, we can succeed in providing quality education for all children and young people. When Sri Lanka has achieved um, a literacy rate of more than 92%, and you have achieved gender parity in education, and has put an end to disparity, disparity in school enrollment, you are ahead of most of the countries in this region. You can lead f the way, and you can show the results. But you also have to make sure that the skills people are learning is the skills that the labor market is demanding in this country. It's an example that not only, you know, do not only have to look at the developed world to see good development, you see what we have achieved on healthcare in Ethiopia and Rwanda, what you have achieved on education. There's a lot of lessons learned between countries on how to do it. That means that's why I have hope for us on those um, ambitious goals that were put towards the 2030. We are, uh, in a way, we have seen countries that have been achieving a lot on this, but we still have more work to be done. So in conclusion, I would like to underline that the sustainable development goals are not just a means of fixing what is broken in our world. They will put the world on a new sustainable path. It's our generation's most important task. It's maybe so ambitious that some people say we will never reach it, so why bother? But I think it's so ambitious because we need to bother because it's about how we make sure that we follow this main track towards the biggest international problems we have, both on the environmental side, on the social 
humanitarian side, but also the agenda, the broad pathway to understand the interdependence we have in this world. When I go home to my constituency, I will meet people who have uh, parents who are born or themselves are born in Sri Lanka because you have been through a very difficult time and you have, we have refugees coming from your country. That's one picture of the interdependency of our societies. We see that in a large flood towards Europe now on new, on new immigrants coming, new refugees coming, and I know that if we can't make peace, coexisting, development that includes all in a country, you, it will not just be your conflict, it will be everybody's conflict. And that's what we really now are seeing in the Middle East, where we see the terrorism coming out of, of the, the local conflicts and rolling into our countries. And that's why I believe that the sustainable development goals are so important. Because if we can give jobs, economic opportunity, and a feeling of belonging to everybody in a society, and that there's a hope for the future, then we will also reduce the conflict level, and we will make this world a better place. And I mean, it might sound a bit uh, romantic to say it, but I still believe we have to work for it. Thank you.